today. Welcome to the service of worship uh, during the season of Lent. Welcome in the name of the living God to one and all. Friends, brothers, and sisters, then, if you will, prepare your hearts and your minds to worship the living God. The call to worship today from Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. And let us worship the God of heaven and earth, the God of time and eternity, the one enthroned in the heavens. Ukraine. 
And so, living God, we make all these our prayers to you, praying to you as Christ taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We arrive today at the, at our, the second installment of the, the Revelation series. Uh, we're not going strictly through Revelation uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, uh, kind of hitting the high points as we go along. Uh, last week was all of, of chapter 1, uh, and we've moved through now to the ending of chapter 3, to the, the last of the messages to the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, this to the church in Laodicea. And so if you will, listen for what the Spirit might say to the church today. Listen to God's Word. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe you, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne. Just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And it's thus far the reading of God's Word. Thank you. 
bouncing off of last week, we recall that John writes Revelation first off to seven churches in, in what is today Turkey in the first century. And he begins his letter to those first century congregations with uh, statements that what he is sharing is soon to take place because the time is near. We think of Paul's letters in the, in the New Testament. Uh, some were written to individuals by Lehman, uh, the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and, and Titus. But the, in the main, they're written to churches, Colossians and Ephesians and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, uh, Romans and 1st and 2nd uh, and Thessalonians. Those are all letters to churches addressing issues and challenges in those churches, again, in the first century. Yet, those inspired writings continue to open up timeless truths to us today in the 21st century. So as we consider the, the last of the messages to the seven churches of Revelation in today's reading, perhaps consider that while Revelation is aimed First, at those first century congregations, it yet speaks to us today across the centuries. The message to the church in Laodicea is the final and the last of the messages to the seven churches, which opens up the book of Revelation. And Laodicea was a city located on the, the Lycus River, and again, what is today the modern nation of Turkey. Uh, Laodicea was known for a medical school that was located in the city which produced uh, kind of eye medicine or eye salve, for which it was famous. It was a location where shepherds produced uh, sheep uh, that had a, a sort of striking black wool, and so clothing was made from that black wool. And not least, Laodicea had residents involved in finance and banking. It, Laodicea, was a prosperous and well-to-do city. And of interest in relation to the message in Revelation to the church in the city of Laodicea, it had no natural source of water. It had to have water piped in from the nearby city six miles away of Heropolis, where they had a hot spring, a mineral spring that produced water, and that would be piped over to Laodicea. By the time that hot water left Heropolis and got to Laodicea, it was described by contemporaries as tepid and lukewarm and nauseating. The risen Christ who walked among the churches in chapter 1 of Revelation has addressed six other churches through John, and now this message to Laodicea ends that series of messages. So if you look at the text this morning, Christ calls himself in verse 14 the, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, who is the origin of God's creation. John's Gospel in, in chapter 1, which we read most often each year at Christmas, uh, speaks of Jesus as the Logos, as the, the co-eternal Son of God, as the one who shares fully in divinity with God the Father. It's through Christ that the Father creates all that is. So that's the claim, the claim of divinity that, that Christ is making for himself in this passage when he describes himself as the Amen. Isaiah 65, 16 in the Old Testament is the only other passage in the Bible where Amen is used as a descriptive in that way. The God of Israel, Yahweh, calls himself the God of Amen. So sh Amen meaning so shall it be. It is Christ, the Son of God himself, the Amen who addresses the church in Laodicea, and who speaks likewise to us. So the messages to the seven churches in Revelation variously commend or upbraid the congregations. Laodicea comes in, interestingly, for no commendation, only warning, only a call to repent. There were locations then, as, as always and even today, where Springs were reputed to have medicinal or healing or restorative properties of one sort or another. You might think of Hot Springs, Arkansas, or Hot Springs, North Carolina, or Saratoga Springs, New York, as towns which form around a hot or cold spring. 
As I say, Laodicea's neighboring city of Hierapolis was known for its hot spring mineral water. Colossae, the church in Colossae, Paul wrote the letter to the church in Colossae, the letter to the Colossians. Colossae is another nearby town near to Laodicea. They had a cold spring, a mineral spring. So there's, there the, there's the, city of La, the city of Laodicea situated between these two hot and cold springs. And Christ tells the Laodicean church that he wishes that they were hot or cold rather than lukewarm, like the water that is piped into the city. And he threatens to, in rather striking imagery, spit them out. If we order coffee at a, a restaurant and presume it will come to the table uh, piping hot, we might order iced Coffee. We order hot tea or iced tea, but I, I rarely hear anyone order room temperature tea or lukewarm coffee. The Laodiceans are hearing in this message that their apathy is like tepid water. Their spiritual condition is analogous to the almost undrinkable water that arrives to their city. So an appeal is made to something that the Laodiceans will well understand. Tepid water becomes a symbol for the church itself. And so there, a kind of thermostat is applied to the Christian life in this passage for then and for now. Do we have commitment or are we apathetic? Are we hot or cold or lukewarm? And again, remember, Laodicea is a prosperous center of banking and, and uh, the production is involved in the production of eye medicine uh, and in the wool trade. We hear in verse 17, again, about their spiritual condition, bouncing off of those key aspects of their identity as Laodiceans. Those who think they are wealthy are, in fact, poor. Those who think they are clothed are really naked. And those who believe that they can see are, in fact, blind. One might imagine that in this young church, the the believers are going through the motions, are saying the right things, but their heart isn't in it, as, as it were. They are lukewarm, whatever that might have meant for them. They, they've lost their zeal. There's no fire in their belly. It could be that the prosperity of that church has choked out its faith. The, they boast that they have everything and they need nothing. And I hear in that an echo of Jesus' parable of the, the rich fool in Luke 12. It's the, the farmer who has a bumper crop, who's prosperous, who looks at his barn uh, full to bursting, and he says, now it's time to eat, drink, and be merry. And, and the message comes to him, thou fool, tonight thine souls shall be required of thee. There is a little more bad news for Laodicea. They've, they've pushed Jesus through apathy or pride or indifference outside of the church. But, here's, but having said that, here is the good news. Jesus has not left them. He is standing outside the door of the church, knocking. The text says, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. The image of Jesus standing at the door and knocking is often applied to individuals as a kind of an evangelistic appeal. We have the, the bulletin cover this morning representing that. In context, though, that image is addressed to the whole church in Laodicea. It's an invitation for the whole church to repent, to let Christ back into the church. I hear echoes in that, too, of Christ saying, I'll come in to eat with you and you'll eat with me. I hear echoes of Luke 24 in that passage. If you remember, Jesus, the risen Christ, on that first Easter was invited to eat supper with two disciples as they walked toward the village of Emmaus. They didn't recognize him as they walked with him and spoke with him, but as they ate with the risen Christ, their eyes were open and they recognized him. The promise to eat, to share a meal with the Laodiceans is the promise of restored relationship and renewed faith. All is not lost for the church in Laodicea. Paul writes in Romans in chapter 8 that in spite of the worst that, that can come our way, trials and tribulation, even death itself, he says that we are more than conquerors in Christ. And that's the promise that Christ gives to the church in Laodicea. If they will open the door to him and allow him to come in to them, 
They will sit with him on his throne, and they will sit alongside him, the one who is conquered on their behalf. Christ has conquered sin and death and is seated on God's throne, the New Testament tells us. The promise to believers is that in Christ they share in that victory in spite of every circumstance, be it suffering or trial or tribulation or persecution, those who trust in Christ and rest in God's grace in Jesus Christ, even you and me, are, are lifted up already with Christ and share in his victory and reign. The message to the Laodicean church is a fitting conclusion to the opening of Revelation, to that address, initial address to those seven congregations. As we make our pivot to the rest of Revelation uh, hereafter and the unfolding of its images and visions, the message comes to us from Laodicea to the 21st century church in America. In all of our prosperity and our ease, Christ still says to us, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So open the door of the church and dine with me, invite me into your hearts, into the life of your church, into the fellowship of God's people, and be assured that despite and in spite of every appearance to the contrary, the worst that life can throw your way, even when events may appear bleak, Christ tells us, assures us, promises us that we share in his reign, in his Victory. Amen.